for today's session. Uh, this is the Seven Figure Agency Podcast, where we interview successful digital marketing agencies from across the country. And I could not be more excited to have Bill Hauser with us from SMB Team. Bill, welcome. Thanks so much for being on with us. Man, I am super excited to see these heavy hitters that you're working with across the nation uh, go out and implement this information in their agency. So I'm excited. Sounds great. So as I understand it, Bill, you've grown your agency from you know start to $15 million per year over the last four years or so. Is that right? Yeah. So yeah, we're, we're billing right now at um, coming up on the $1.5 million a month mark. We're getting a little bit of an echo. Uh, is that coming on my end? Um, just hearing a little bit of an echo when I'm talking, but yeah. So yeah, we, we went from uh, zero to uh, we're coming up on the $20 million ARR mark right now, four and a half years. So uh, 50 full-time W2 employees um, and uh, I've got a 75 net promoter score across the agency over a 90% renewal rate. Um, so yeah, it, it feels like it's been, it's been like just this rapid learning roller coaster uh, which I'm excited to share the lessons and bumps and bruises on. So that sounds like a phenomenal ascent. So guys, if you're watching this live, type live in the comments so we know you're here with us. Uh, if you're watching replay, type replay. Um, if you're excited to hear Bill unpack how he grew from zero to 15 million and growing in less than five years, give me a yes in the comments and and let's get into it. Uh, so I guess I guess the best place to start, Bill, just tell us a little bit about your background, and how you got started in the in the marketing world. Yeah. So, you know, I'm trying to give as much tactical value here as possible, but I do think um, the getting started story is important because uh, for me, my story was just a lot of not so positive stuff. Unfortunately, you know, my family went bankrupt in uh, in 2008. Um, I watched my dad uh, with his $2 million paving business go completely under, um, which led to basically his um, his going to the bottle and and uh, and ultimately almost committing suicide. Uh, so I actually got a video of my dad one day with a gun to his head about to take his own life um, at the at the end of everything that happened in the recession. And it was one of the most painful experiences that ever happened uh, in my life. But it also was one of the greatest lessons um, I ever learned because it caused me to really ponder around why did my dad's business go under? You know, why, why did he go bankrupt when a recession hit? Um, and what I found out was that he was not targeting a recession proof niche, which we'll talk about today. Um, and he did not have a brand, which, you know, he was depending on just all direct lead generation, like yellow pages ads. Uh, and third is he didn't know how to build a team. So it was all dependent on, you know, his expertise. So when I started SMB team, uh, the first thing I looked into was how do I actually navigate against being, you know, contingent on a recession or GDP changes? Um, how do we actually learn how to build a team? And then how do we also learn how to build a brand? Um, so when I started SMB team, uh, because of the experiences with my dad, I decided to do the opposite of basically everything he did. And um, whereas he was running his business, like by the seat of his pants, uh, basically just entering each year with, what are we going to do this year? You know, no strategic plan, no clear annual plan, no core values. Uh, when I started SMB, I had so much pain wrapped up in what had happened that um, I created a 10 year plan before I even sold one client because I was so scared. And I wrote it all out in an Excel spreadsheet. Um, and I wrote out my annual revenues every year for 10 years and said, I'm going to come hell or high water. I'm going to figure out how to reach these revenue numbers and do whatever personal development it took to get there. Um, and uh, yeah, so now now I'm here and uh, we're at year four and a half of that Excel spreadsheet I created, you know, uh, six years ago or so. That's amazing, man. What a, what a powerful story to go from, you know, that experience growing up to where you're crushing it now. Um, first of all, congratulations and kudos. It's phenomenal what, you, what you've accomplished. Um, Tell us a little bit about kind of your agency, the the niche that you serve, kind of what your what your business model looks like. Yeah. So the 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 first point I think that's really important to hit on. I, I was you added me to the Facebook group. Thank you for doing that. You have some amazing people in that group. So you've really built a movement around what you're doing. Um, and I was looking at some of the comments before today, 
just to think about like, what are people bringing up as problems? And the first thing I notice is some people are targeting the wrong niche, right? So like I, I was looking through, like if you're targeting restaurants throughout COVID, you're screwed. If you're targeting fitness studios through COVID, you're screwed, right? And um, so I want to first start with like, I'll share why we chose lawyers and the business model behind it, which is your question. The reason we chose lawyers, which is our primary niche, was not from a, oh, whatever, what do I like? The market doesn't care what you like if it doesn't actually tie into a valid business model. What I mean by that is if you're passionate about underwater basket weaving and no one needs marketing for that, the market doesn't care that you're passionate about underwater basket, weave, basket weaving, right? So I, I was not passionate about lawyers, but I found a way to become passionate about lawyers after I did research on IBIS World. And I found that the legal vertical, along with about 20 to 25 other, other service verticals, were not tied to GDP changes. So what that means is that when consu like right now, consumer sentiment is the lowest it's been in 10 years at the time we're doing this. Um, and GDP changes typically follow dips in consumer sentiment. So when people get more anxious, when a recession is looming, people stop spending money on stuff. So discretionary verticals are going to see a huge dip in agency revenue. That's why I really respect what you built, Josh, is the HVAC and plumbing vertical is not tied to GDP changes. There's some dips, right? But if someone's air conditioning goes out in the middle of the summer, they're not going to wait until the recession ends to fix their air conditioning, right? Yep. So there is a high level of sustained need behind HVAC and plumbing as a vertical. Similarly with legal services, if someone gets hit in a you know, car accident, consumers are still going to demand lawyers, right? And they're not going to wait till a recession ends to go hire a lawyer. So demand for a recession proof niche will not dip as uh, GDP dips. So that was my number one reason for choosing legal. And then separately from that, we looked at, um, I learned a lot of this from Jeff Bezos, like when he went into Amazon, he talked about, he did an analysis around books. He didn't just stumble into books. He looked at the growth rate of the internet, right? And he combined it with the pain points of buying books through physical stores. And he met the trend, right, of, of the internet with the pain point of book sales, right, through a traditional brick and mortar. And lo and behold, he found Amazon, right? So, you know, when I went into SMB team, I said, okay, well, what other research should I do in the vertical? And the next piece was after talking to a lot of experts and reading stuff from experts like you, you know, I started thinking, hmm, does it make sense to target a vertical with a higher average profit per client, not gross revenue per client? Okay. So profit per client is one of the top keys. If you're targeting a vertical in your agency, you want to make sure you're targeting someone with a high profit per client, right? And the reason for that is because if the business does not have a high margin per client, they're not going to be able to spend a lot of money on marketing. So think of like, I'll, I'll use restaurants as an example. Typically, unless it's a truly differentiated restaurant, it's very low margin, very transactional. And you're going to have to work really hard as an agency to get them results, right? And then on the other side, let's say there's a big construction contractor right? And they do huge projects, but they make 1% margin on those construction projects. It seems like their average client value is big. Their average margin per client is big, but it's actually not. And they're going to cancel with your agency faster than a business that has high margin per client. So that was the second criteria that we looked at. Um, and then the, uh, the third thing was making sure that it aligned with our competencies, which our competencies were local SEO, and PPC management, which there was a high demand for lawyers to get done. So we weren't like e-commerce PPC experts. So we did the marriage of our competencies with a high average margin per client with that uh, recession proof vertical choice. And that was ultimately where we decided on, on legal services. So um, I can then go into like, how did we augment our product? Because when we started, uh, we were just doing PPC. Because, you know, I followed the, you know, again, the experts like you, all, all of them said, you know, choose a niche, choose a niche, choose a niche. And I did that to get to 1.5 million, right? I just did one niche. 
And then we ran into horrific retention problems. Clients just weren't retaining with us, even if we got them results. So rather than going and pounding my head against the wall saying, we're a PPC agency for lawyers, we're a PPC, we went and we rethought our business model, right? So we went, did research, we, we watched, we read all these articles, we hired a consultant. We found out that the highest retention agencies were not selling a la carte services. They were selling full service, right? So I had a very difficult choice to make. Do I want to just be a PPC expert or do I want to go into an area where I'm not really that comfortable and build a team around something I don't know a lot about? So I chose that second option. So we started throwing in uh, website design, SEO, Facebook ads, and the PPC. And then as soon as we combined all this together, our retention rates skyrocketed. We had diversification across ad platforms, meaning if something wasn't working on Google ads, we were able to pivot and be more aggressive on one of the other uh, platforms that we were managing for the attorneys. So, and, and then the attorney wasn't looking at us as a vendor. They were looking at us as a full service marketing partner. And there was just a certain level of added trust when we went full service. Um, and, and yeah, I don't know if we want to go into this, but we also built an $8 million coaching business as a bolt on to our agency which coaches the attorneys on how to build a better business so that as we send them leads, they can actually scale alongside it. Kind of like what you're doing with seven figure agency, uh, we, we do for attorneys. So uh, yeah, it's just been, I would call all of that, I would bucket that all into business model innovation. Like don't be afraid to not tolerate what your original skill or passion was when you started your agency. Love that. So good. And I love the fact that you, you really thought through like, what's the right niche? And it's not just, you know, whatever I like, it's like, what's going to have the right economic model for me that makes sense. I liked thinking about the profit per client and making sure that they would have that financial resource. Um, really, really great insights, guys. Comments in the, in the chat here, if you're getting value and you're kind of getting some takeaways about how to think uh, all the way through to like planning out 10 years in advance. Like if I want to go to X, let me think that through in advance and plot it out, right? You can never get to a destination if you haven't thought that stuff through yep. in advance. Um, and then kind of innovating the offer, right? Not just like I'm a pay-per-click company, but now I'm a, I'm a full-service company that helps these, these, uh, these legal practices generate results, grow. Yep. And I guess at some point you recognized just generating the leads wasn't enough. I need to also help them figure out how to convert those leads and how to you know, really run their business model. And that's why you got into the coaching side of the business, Yep. Um, love it. Lots of great insights as you explain that. What, like, what is it that an attorney buys from you today? So if, if somebody wants yep. to become an SMB team client, like what are they buying? How much are they paying? Just kind of give us the lay of the land on that yeah. front. Yeah. So, um, so right now we have two, it's funny. I say right now with extreme caution because we innovate so fast. That Absolutely changes, change. right? Yeah. So right now we're selling what's called elite 360 max. Uh, is our one product. And then our second product is uh, Coach Squared, as we call it. So Coach Squared gives, uh, gives them access to a marketing track coaching and then a management uh, track coaching. And then Elite 360 um, is where we now package our coaching into our full service marketing portfolio. Uh, so the full service, the 360 package costs uh, $64.97 per month. So $6,500 a month. Uh, and then the coaching only package, Coach Squared, costs uh, $29.97 per month, 12 months. Um, and then most people, 80% plus, do the entire package. Um, and, you know, it's very interesting as we've gone up in pricing, uh, it's become easier to sell. Um, and the reason is because I'm able to more easily, well, we have. Don't don't let me forget talking about how we sell from stage and we we uh, you got to get into that for this but yeah <laughs> but um the it's so interesting as our price point has gone up that our our sales it's become so much easier because we can talk to all the stuff they're going to be able to cancel when they sign up with us right they're going to be able to not have 15 different vendors for everything we're really able to show them that instead of spending 15k a month for all this stuff you can just hire one company with one point of contact that you trust and not even have to manage these 15 vendors. And you're going to pay less than half 
than what you would have spent otherwise without the headache of managing 15 vendors. It's like, it's a no brainer. And the coaching makes us blue ocean. So they can't literally cannot get full service marketing and coaching from any other company in the industry. No one does full service marketing and coaching. There's some agencies that do social media marketing plus coaching. There's others that do video plus coaching, right? But there's no one that does full stack marketing plus coaching. So we're able to truly say when we're on sales calls or doing events, this is the only, the only available option for you, right? And we know, Mr. Attorney, that you don't just need leads. What do you mean? Uh, have you ever gotten a ton of leads and not grown your law firm? <laughs> oh, yeah. Great. It's probably because you don't know how to build an intake process to vet your leads. You probably don't know how to build a sales team. You probably don't know how to hire properly. You probably don't know how to run your business on traction with quarterly rocks, right? You probably don't know all the things that are holding you from growing your firm. So the question is this, do you just want to hire another marketing agency or do you really want to transform your firm and get the coaching that you need so that you can actually deserve to grow your law firm when we send you all the leads? Sign here now. Let's get this moving. Love it. Love it. So, so, so good. So um, they can either buy the marketing by itself, they can buy the coaching by itself, but most of them say, I need the full, the full program, which includes both. Yep. Um, and on the marketing side of either of those, that includes kind of the website, the SEO, pay-per-click management. That's kind of the mix of services tracking, some marketing automation potentially. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. So it's, it's website, SEO, um, PPC. So Google ads and local services ads management. Um, and then the cool thing about our marketing coaching is we do the Facebook ads management and we also coach them on how to make the selfie form videos. Mm. And, and so that's also another blue ocean is because a lot of agencies struggle because the business owner that they're doing marketing for doesn't know how to make the videos that are going to succeed on social media. Right. So we just said, screw it. We're going to solve that problem. Uh, so that's where the marketing coaching starts to tie in to the done for you Facebook ad. So it's, it's pretty much the only thing we won't do is um, I, I'd say organic um, like social media posting. And here's an interesting thing on this. A lot of clients say they want us to post their Facebook page and they want us to do all this crap that's not going to get them a result, right? And so we've, we have an educational sales process where we politely say if they want done for you, like organic Facebook posting, we, you know, we'll, we'll ask them, great. Do you want something? Do you want the 80, 20 here? Do you want something that's going to have a real impact on your firm? Or are you just looking to post up on your Facebook page? Right. And most times we'll go, well, I want the stuff that's going to work. Great. So let's not talk about something that's not going to work. Right. So uh, that, that's been really important for us is not tolerating when a client tells us they want something that we know is not within that 80, 20 of what's going to get them the results. Focus on impact, not activity. I, I love that. And um, I think something he said there that I want to make sure you guys all took away um, as he looks at his service offering, you know, it's not an, at this point, it's not a differentiating factor to say, I specialize in work with attorneys or I specialize in working with plumbing companies, right? It's now, it's like you got to figure out what is going to make you different than the rest. What's going to help you generate a better, tangible, measurable outcome for the clients? I think you've nailed that with your service offering and the coaching part that makes you stand out and makes you generate above standard results, uh, above expectation. So I love that. Great, great background here. So we've got a pretty good understanding, you know, the niche, what you're offering to the niche. Um, yep. We'd love to like shift focus here and talk a little bit about how you land clients. Um, okay. Because at 15 million, going close to 20 million, you've got a process where you're landing clients on a pretty consistent basis. Talk to me a little bit about what that looks like in SMB team. Oh man, I can't believe I'm giving this away right now. All hey right, guys, give go. me a, give me a yes if you're excited to hear uh, Bill kind of explain how they land clients and how he's getting this this massive growth in his business. Right. This this is what when I emailed you, this is what I was hesitant about, but um, but I'll give you guys all the secrets. So awesome. Um, okay. So first of all, I'll start with, uh, we, we lost our entire sales team. We were doing the traditional, um, the traditional kind of lead gen approach. We were running Google ads for lawyers, um, which by the way, worked really well to take us from 460K in our first year to 1.5 in our second year. 
The only difference was we started spending, you know, 10 to 18 K a month on Google ads. Um, uh, some, some months a little higher than that, you know, 20, 26 K or so. Um, so we started spending a lot of money on Google ads, sending that to a sales team. Um, and then like my top guy quit and I was screwed. And then I had to get back on the phone again and we went backwards. Um, and then COVID-19 hit. You'll see why I'm telling this story first. So COVID-19 hits. Um, I met this guy at, um, this guy, his name is Jason Fladlin. He's the author of the book, One to Many. Um, and, you know, basically had read his book. Right after I read his book, I emailed him and said, um, you know, I'd like to learn how he does webinars, right? And, is, and then, like, literally a day after COVID hits, and I already had my plan. This is why having an annual plan is so important. I had a plan written and communicated to my team that we are going from 1.5 to 4.5 million in one year, right? That was our goal from my second to third year in business. And it was already pre-communicated. And then COVID hits. And I had this ultimate choice to make. Am I going to go scrap the goal that I wrote down a few years ago? Or am I going to get resourceful and change my business model to embrace what's currently happening? So looked up this stat on how Zoom usage immediately spiked, right? I knew nothing about webinars, never, ever did a webinar before. And the PPP loans, you remember when the PPP loans? Yeah. So I put two and two together and I said, I'm going to embrace webinars and I'm going to teach lawyers how to do PPP loans. Mm. Right? My fourth webinar ever, <laughs> I had 3,777 lawyers register. Wow. 3,700 lawyers registered for this PPP webinar. And I wasn't even the expert on the topic. It was just such breaking news that our cost per registrant was like negative 20 cents. Like it was, it was the craziest thing ever. Um, and so we got all these lawyers on a webinar, literally, Josh, my armpits, if you would have seen under my shirt, like I was dripping sweat. I was like shaking. And I found this PPP expert, I interviewed him, and that built our email list by 3,700 people with that, with that one event. And I turned that into a talk show, which now uh, has, has turned into uh, the biggest legal industry talk show, where I started interviewing other like big name lawyers, uh, kind of like what you do with this, right? Um, and then that turned into you know, me interviewing you know, Ed Milet, uh, you know, Damon John from Shark Tank, Kevin mm. O'Leary. Shark Tank, James Clear, uh, Vern Harnish, author of Scaling Up, um, you know, Magic Johnson, uh, Emmett Smith, all-time winning uh, le leading rusher in the NFL. It it's crazy. And it just spiraled into this webinar-based talk show that I would hold on Tuesdays at 4 p.m. I had no intentions to sell anything, Josh. No intentions. I was just like, how can I provide value to the legal industry? And then I ran into this problem after like a month of doing all these talk shows or, or two months. I'm like, how am I going to make some money from this? I got these huge goals, right? So then, you know, I, I reached out to Jason Fladlin again and he agreed to giving me a one on one call with him for some odd reason because I showed him the 3,700 people I got on the event. He's like, I got to see how you did this. So he took the call with me and he told me everything he knew about selling from webinars, right? So within one week, I shut off my thinking mind after that call and just launched this course on, it's called the Grand Lawyer Marketing Plan. And, you know, we got 500 lawyers to sign up for this online course, which then ended up becoming a lead generator for our agency, right? Which turned mm -hmm. into probably north of a hundred clients that just came from that one strategy, right? Wow. And that all came from me learning webinars, right? So we're doing these talk shows. And then I do a, a 90 minute pitch webinar on like a 997 course thing, right? So then I started thinking bigger, right? I, I met, um, I'm in War Room and I met with, you know, Pete Vargas and, uh, and you know, uh, Grant Cardone uh, mentored me for two years. And uh, so I started seeing like, okay, well, these people are pulling off these like boot camps, like, what are these boot camp things where you go live for like three days straight and you get all these big speakers? So, so I'm doing all these talk shows, right? One interview per show. And I'm like, screw it. We're going to do a summit, right? So little did I know summits were supposed to be like once a year. 
So <laughs> I didn't know that. So I just started calling every quarterly event we held a summit. So nice. like we had a summit every like two months, right? Um, so, and they were virtual. And um, so we started sending out invites to people to speak at our events. And, you know, uh, the first two people who agreed that were big names was uh, Jordan Belfort and um, Wolf of Wall Street and uh, um, oh, Kevin Harrington, the original shark on Shark Tank. So, so I had the these big names to gather attention. Exactly. So that, but that's how we built the email list is through those big names, right? Because no one knew me from Joe Schmo, right? So we held this big event and uh, lo and behold, um, we signed up, I think it was like 17 agency clients in like the first three hours of the event. I was like, holy crap, here is the problem. We were doing three month opt outs, right? So then the next event, I was like, can we do six months from stage? And we did six months. And then the next event, can we do 12 months from stage, right? And then the next event, could we do, instead of 2,000 a month, could we do 4,000 a month from stage? Could we do, you know, uh, 5,000? And then our last event, you know, we did $6,500 12-month contract from stage. So a $78,000 offer from stage. Um, and we brought in, you know, in our last three events, we bring in $2 million in ARR per event through these virtual events. Um, our last event was Magic Johnson, Kevin O'Leary, Nick Santo, the guy who had, uh, who has no arms, no legs. Um, uh, we had judge faith who ran divorce court. Um, we had the biggest personal injury lawyer in Michigan, Mike Morris. Um, and it's really just spiraled into this blue ocean strategy um, where I, I, I don't even need a sales team and we're able to get, you know, anywhere between 20 to 40 clients from these, from these big virtual events, uh, which then has forced us to create group onboarding processes. Cause we have to onboard so many people at once. We've had to set up processes where people who are experts in our Google, my business SEO optimization, they have to actually stop doing what they're doing for two weeks after an event. And they have to follow a different project management process to facilitate the onboarding um, of that many people at once. So, uh, so that, in a nutshell, is kind of our our sales strategy. Is we're we're doing these big virtual events. Um, I think the heart, the big the big um, thing I want to give everyone as a cautionary tale is. You have to sell risk reversal at the event. I know it sucks, but no one, if you can figure it out, let me know. But I, I don't believe anyone's going to sign up for a $78,000 offer without some trial window of something, right? So we have tested this. We completely flopped on an event where we went right to the full contract commitment. It was the most painful experience in any of these events I've ever done. We spent $250,000 on this event and made one sale. It was the worst thing that ever happened to me. Wow. The events. And the only thing that changed was we removed the risk reversal. Um, so yeah, I, I'd like you to steer me because I, that, go, one, that would hurt. That would hurt a little bit, but the, yeah. uh, so the risk reversal is just a guarantee or is it a, a guarantee with money back? If you don't like what, talk to us a little bit about what worked best on that front. Yeah. So, so the risk reversal is, um, it basically says that, um, the full commitment of this is $78,000 a year paid out each month, you know, 64, 97 a month for 12 months. But since you're at this event, right. And I know you don't know everything you're getting into yet. We're going to be extending you a 14 day risk free three step guarantee. Never say trial ever. The word trial will kill you, right? So when we, again, we tested this risk-free three-step guarantee is very different than a trial, right? When someone enters a trial in their mind, it's they're already out the door, right? Yeah. So we have to get them to make the commitment and then give them a 14 day risk-free guarantee, three-step guarantee. So that is this. If within the first 14 days, you submit us one page of your vision for your law firm, 
you attend your one-on-one -on -one onboarding call and you attend the two weeks of coaching sessions, you can get your deposit back. We usually do a $2,000 deposit, right? You can get your deposit back and back out. That simple. And that's something, you know, Alex Hormozzi talks about the contingent risk reversal, Yeah. Um, which is, I highly recommend not, not ever doing an uncontingent, like just get your money back you for any reason. Three things and we'll give it back. So now there's something on their plate to do. It also gets them bought into the process and they're going to get the value that they came for because they showed up for that onboard call. They went through that coaching. They thought about that vision. Um, yep. And I'm sure your, your stick rate is, is really high with this. Yep. Yeah. And it's, it's really interesting. Our average stick rate on the risk reversal is north of 90%. Um, and, but there's, you got to have a great first 14 day experience. Right. Um, if you mess one thing up toast, they're thinking about, so it's like, it's gotta, you gotta micromanage that 14 day onboarding. Love it. I mean, this is powerful share guy type powerful in the comments, you know, Bill is on here sharing this information of his own free will. This is, this is amazing. Um, the, 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 the actual payment, it's a $2,000 deposit. Do they not incur the actual payment until the 14 days is up? Or when does that, just curious when that comes into play? Yeah, so the payment, it's a good question. So um, again, we've, we've tested this. We process the, the net difference. So let's say they sign up for the $6,500 a month package. Um, we'll process the $2,000 deposit. And then when they sign the contract, so they leave a deposit and then they have to sign our, our PandaDoc contract, right? So the net difference between their deposit and the total monthly amount is processed when they sign the contract. So that, it, can that, makes within, sense. that can be within, you know, an hour of them leaving the deposit. Love it. Love it. So very, very different sales process than most agencies follow, right? Mm -hmm. Most of us, we're doing marketing. We get them on a strategy session. We sell them through. That works. It's a little bit slower burn. What you did was you went big with one to many webinars and you figured out how to sell the live event experience and kind of sell the sell the service. Um, two things I want you guys to recognize. His first webinar wasn't how to explode your law practice by getting your internet marketing dialed in. It wasn't even anything about marketing. It was something very, very topical, very, very relevant that was going to put money in their pocket. It was around PPP. Um, so really think about what the trend is, what's something you can add value in your industry, and it doesn't have to be specific to what it is that you do. Um, on these, on these summits, yep. what, like what's the basic, you know, thing, are they learning about marketing or are they le learning about digital marketing? Like, what are you teaching at these summits, um, that, that gets them to come in and gets them so excited about hiring these services? So, um, so we're selling a transformation, mm. um, and someone in your Facebook group who attended one of our events um, commented on your post and said that he attended one of our events and said, we don't really talk much about marketing or any of the services that we provide. We provide a transformation to a stuck law firm owner. So when we're thinking through like an event theme, you know, our last event, we had 980 lawyers register for it. Um, the one with Kevin O'Leary and Magic Johnson, and it was called the Relentless Lawyer three-day immersion boot camp. So we're going to think through like how, when we're titling an event, we're going to think through what is the dream outcome that this attorney wants, right? And we're going to think through like all the things they want, time freedom, double their revenues, double their profits, uh, reduce stress, reduce overwhelm. And we're going to think, how do we tie that into an identity frame? Um, so the relentless lawyer character was the character behind this event. So relentless lawyer, what does it mean to be a relentless lawyer? Well, a relentless lawyer is someone who doesn't take no for an answer when it comes to their dreams, right? It's someone who uh, uh, can, can double their law firm if they decide to and won't make excuses for it. It's someone who can make whatever free time they want, right? Because they built the team that can run their firm without them, right? So if you wanna become like this, then sign up for the Relentless Lawyer three-day immersion bootcamp. And by the way, you're going to be learning from these thought leaders who have never been brought to the legal industry before to show you how they became relentless in their businesses. Because as Jay Abraham says, you're going to learn all of your best 
stuff around how to grow your business from other industries. So we have to shatter the belief that they need to be learning from lawyers. So we're always thinking of like the, I'm in inner circle, the, the 50K program, Russell, Br uh, Ru Russell Brunson. And uh, we always talk about like shattering beliefs, right? Like, so, so how do we fall, identify the, I know you know all about this stuff because you're a great marketer, right? So we're going to list what are their biggest negative beliefs and we're going to shatter them. Okay, well, Bill's not a lawyer. How do we shatter that belief? Great, Bill's not a lawyer. And what has learning from lawyers gotten you in the past? Probably more of the same old crap. Are you ready to learn from someone? Who's no, I think I might have lost your audio here for a sec. Can you hear me okay? Let me see. Somebody in comments, let us know if you're still hearing. Yeah, they can't hear either. Interesting. You might just need to check your audio plug real quick because so, something is not coming through. Guys, while, while he gets the audio back, um, what are some of your takeaways? What are some of your insights? Uh, what are some of the things you learned? Are you guys hearing me as I'm speaking? Can you hear Josh? We got you from another angle now. They can hear me. They just can't hear you at the moment. All right, check one, two. Yes. All right, beautiful. Let's turn this off over here. Can we turn turn off the audio? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. loud and clear. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn off our TV. This was a great pause, Bill, because everybody's getting so many great insights that they like. They need a second to to re like recalibrate. Um, Guys, takeaways in the comments as we're going. Um, All right, I'm back. Beautiful. We hear you loud and clear. There's no echo right now, so it sounds great. I, I was on camera so much recently that my uh, my microphone died. So ah, I heard a click, and I'm like, okay, something's. I'm not sure if it's on my end or yours. Yeah. So you were talking about uh, you were talking about like the transformation and how you how you kind of sell the transformation to get them to come, uh, and then kind of how you craft the content of these summits to bring them to a crest point where they're like, this was me before, this is where I want to go. And this is why I need to hire SMB for this, for this retainer service. Yep. So, so, so it all comes. So we have to, the number one problem that I believe business owners have is they just don't believe they can grow their business. And most marketers miss that. So like, when you start selling what you do in the back of their head, they're just thinking, yeah, whatever. If I sign up for this marketing, same crap's going to happen. Mark, I've been burned before. Right. You know, they're, but we have to, we have to sell them on the belief that they actually can double their law firm, that they actually can take their law firm to a new level. And until they believe that they're going to look at no matter how good our offer is, they're going to have the voice in the back of their head that goes, eh, maybe it will work, but I'm, not, I'm still not gonna be able to hire people. I'm still not gonna be able to take my firm to the next level. So we really try to get to that underlying, underlying, underlying belief that's holding them back from growing their law firm in the first place. And then when we sell our service beyond that point, so we literally have people identify, we have them identify, what is your three-year vision for your law firm? That's why it's part of our three-step risk reversal. During our events, we're always like, what is your vision? What's gonna be required this year in your budget to make that vision come true. Are you going to have to spend, you know, what a lot of experts say in the legal industry is you're going to have to spend 20% of your annual goal, 20% of your annual goal, this year's goal on marketing. If you want to scale your law firm, what is that number? Write it into the chat right now. Let's hold you accountable to it. Is everyone committed to spending what's required to reach your annual goal that ladders up to your three-year vision, yes or no? Because you might as well sign off of the event right now, right? So I'll do like the push away. Okay, great. If everyone's committed to actually spending where your vision and where your potential is, right, then let's continue. So now we've had them price anchor in their head. Oh, I'm, I'm able to spend 20% of my annual growth goal on marketing. So now 
a seven figure law firm is going to look at their marketing budget and they're going to go, oh, well, this is only 10%, right? This $6,400 a month offer. So, and I just publicly committed that I'm going to spend 20% of my growth goal on marketing. Let's, so let's hear what they have to say. Well, we, we manage your Facebook ads and here's the strategy that we use. That's it. Here's what we do. Here's the strategy. We do your website. Here's what we do. Here's the strategy. All you need is one product insight per piece of your strategy. For example, we do Facebook ads. And then, so we do, we, uh, you ever watch the Steve Jobs Apple product launch? Yep. So I'll watch that before all of our pitches. And I'm like, a oh, stylus? Who wants a stylus, right? You, you, know, you, you drop them, you lose, right? So he'll, he's amazing at pointing out the pain point and then going, so we rethought the whole thing. No more stylus. You can touch your phone with the iPhone, with your finger. So we do that with marketing, with the slices of our marketing service. The number one problem that attorneys experience is direct consultation ads. You've seen it before, Mr. Attorney. The, hi, hire me. Those Facebook ads that you get sold by all these shysty marketing companies out there, we follow a different model. We're going to educate your clients through a three-step video retargeting process called the 25Q process that you'll have rolled out for your firm and you'll have the marketing coaching to learn how to make those videos on a shoestring budget. Cut. Next, SEO. I know what you're thinking. Ah, oh, SEO is too competitive now. It's too blah, 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 blah. Great. We agree with you. SEO is dead. Type dead into the chat right now, right? Dead, 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 dead. It'll flood, right? Then we go, so we just rethought the whole thing. It's not about SEO. It's about maps. That's right. We've done tests on this. And an attorney who had an organic listing here and da 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 da, da uh, and one in the maps, the organic listing got completely plummeted and his maps listing stayed and his phone calls didn't change at all. And then attorney number two, his maps listing dropped and his organic listing stayed and he got no calls from his organic listing, right? So we looked deeper into it and we found X percent of legal da 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 come from maps phone calls. So we designed our whole product around Google Maps. And here's the three prongs we follow for that. Bop, bop, and bop. So now we've we've identified pain point and false belief around that section of our product. Then we've shown them, we thought about a new way, right? And then we show them just the strategy and then we'll move on to the next slice, right? So then when we're doing the pitch, we're able to go, you're, you're able to get access to not only the social media, not only this, not only that, but all of this for the price of, and we'll do a bigger price, and then we'll do the whole infomercial price drop and urgency and all that good stuff. So I guess I'm technically an infomercial salesman. Masterful. Masterful stuff applied to the digital marketing space. I love it. So you're, you're creating this transformation that they buy into. They come to this summit. They hear amazing speakers. They get expired. They get excited. They buy into this future vision of themselves, right? And of course, there's interaction happening. There's chat happening. Um, and then you get them to make this pivot to like, so what does it take to make that a reality? And they start to think about increasing their budget and spend. They start thinking about what they'd have to do with marketing. Um, yep. And then you position your, your, your agency services and your coaching as exactly what they need to make that transformation reality. Yep. Um, and, and I love the way that you get them to, to commit to that 20% increase. And now they've just created this, this money that needs to be plotted somewhere and we're yeah. better than with your, with your program. So, yeah. so good. Yeah. And I'm sure you could, you could go for a day on this topic of like how to promote the event, how to get people to show up to the event, how to get these big name speakers and how much to invest in it. Yeah. And then how to craft the actual experience and the content where it's useful, but also is seeding the service. It's seeding the testimonials of other attorneys that you've worked with. Mm -hmm. And then ultimately how to make the offer, and, and get people to say yes and plot down that deposit and stick around. Um, wish we had time to go that deep. Maybe we can convince you to do some type of masterclass uh, for the group at some point on this topic. I'd love to. Um, guys, one in comments if you've taken some ideas here that you're like, man, this is, this is good. It's next level thinking. It's much bigger thinking um, in terms of selling one to many instead of one to one. Um, just curious, in terms of the sales process, in between the summits – Mm -hmm. Do you still take clients? Are you still doing some strategy sessions with the sales team? Yeah. So we, we have a, a three person sales team um, and we still, we still make a ton of sales from, 
from our from our sales team. Um, and the the key, I think, is that we're very clear on our dominant marketing process, and it's the events. And I always go to bed at night. I know you know you're you're a serial serial entrepreneur like me, right? So we go to bed at night. We think, oh, I could be doing SEO, which I know you're really good at, right? With the plumbery SEO stuff you've done, right? We could be doing more SEO. We could be doing this new strategy. This, this, this. And what I've just learned to do recently is just stop worrying. If I could get 2,000 registrants at, at my next event, I don't need to do any of the SEO or anything else. So what I'm trying to look at is what is the marginal impact from taking something I'm already excellent at and becoming world class at it? Um, and that right now for us is those events. Um so, but to answer your question, the sales process between events will have some evergreen funnels running. So we'll typically have like a simple ebook funnel that goes to a consult. We'll probably have a short webinar training that the book a call thing pops up, you know, minute 30 on autoplay webinar. Um, and we have our talk show, which I can get 20 consults on on average through my talk show. So we'll usually get 200 lawyers on our weekly talk show every Tuesday. Uh, that's just like our sustained talk show that we don't really pitch on. Yep. I will pitch consults on the talk show though. So I will say, Hey, if you haven't learned about performance max, I always try to find something new, right? Like how many of you are using performance max in your current law firm's PPC arsenal right now? Oh, what's that? What and like, what, what's this? I've never heard about this. Right. Exactly. So the power is, uh, is I'm able to introduce a new concept during the talk show and then say, well, great, we're able to extend uh, a maximum of 20 consultations right now for those of you who are attending. So the first 20 of you will get a private one-on-one -on -one call with a strategist on our team, blah, blah, blah. But it's really important that we convey the offer because asking for consultations doesn't work. Asking for consultations with urgency, bonuses, uh, scarcity, right? That works. So I've made the mistake of I've gotten 400 people on our talk show one week. And I just said, if you're interested in learning more, book a call with our team and nobody books consults. But if I frame the consult as a perk, a bonus and urgency, we'll get 20 consults from our, our talk show. So so good. And I like that you call it a talk show. What would ultimately like like it's a, either a podcast or it's a live Zoom interview. Um, you, know, you could call it a lot of things, but no one calls it a talk show. So it really kind of stands out in the marketplace. Yeah, every, everyone says podcast, right? But the talk show um, model, it it also was a consumer insight I had for lawyers specifically. Is it's a little more old school because our mm. average buyer is a little more uh, you know older in, in demographics, right? Um, so talk show is kind of the logical choice for that. So it's a, it's a live Zoom type session where you invite people to come attend. Yep. Um, you give great content. You close with the option for a a consult with a, with proper framing. That fills the funnel for that week for the sales team um, in between the events. Yep. And yeah, yeah. So, and, that, and that's key too is like, is... The um, I could be spending a lot more on evergreen funnels. Again, opportunity costs. Or I could get 400 people on the talk show this week and have a really compelling consult ask on the talk show. So again, it, it I'm only I, I want to make sure everyone listening doesn't just go. I need to do exactly this because maybe you're not as trained in marketing as as Josh and myself, right? So may, maybe you're. Maybe you're better off if you're more introverted. Maybe you're better off doing organic SEO or other strategies. But, um, you know, for us, the talk show, because I'm a pretty yappy person, uh, <laughs> talk show works for my unique ability. Your personality style, for your energy level, for, for all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, just got a comment. Best interview yet. So glad I tuned in. This is, this is great stuff. Um, format for that, for the talk show, are you usually bringing on someone successful in the, in the niche, in the legal space, or is it, you know, could be educational, could be interview. What, what's the format there? So, um, here's a couple of the things I learned on that. And by the way, I wrote down on my sheet, I need to start using restream or something like that. I mean, I, I am wasting so much 
of our marketing resources by not streaming this in our Facebook. Yeah, YouTube. pop it, pop it everywhere, right? Ugh. See, that's the problem with taking massive action is like I miss just little things that could have doubled our kicking myself right now, Josh. Nah, Thank man. you for that. Um, <laughs> so uh, the structure, here's what you don't want to do on a talk show. You don't want to make a talk show about the person that you're interviewing. I know it sounds weird, but what we found, it's very important to retain thought leadership. So, so for example, when we interviewed Emmett Smith, who's the all-time leading rusher uh, running back, a Dallas Cowboys running back, we labeled it how to create unstoppable momentum in your law firm. That talk show was labeled that hmm. and with Emmett Smith, right? And the reason we do that is because we want them, if we're going to spend all this time and money on a talk show, we want them to leave with them thinking we're an expert, not thinking that the person we interviewed was an expert, right? We want the person we interviewed to provide value within the context of the talk show. But so that, so that's really, really, really important. Like for example, Lewis Howes, like who I, I have a mutual friend with Eli wild, who is the top sales guy for, you know him? Yeah. Okay. So I'm very close with Eli and awesome. he was telling me about how, um, you know, uh, Lewis, he regrets having made his whole YouTube channel around other people because he was not able to monetize it to the ability he could have had he put embedded his own thought leadership into it. Right. Love that. So the first, the tactical takeaway for this is on a talk show, I find it very important to own, to dedicate the first 30 minutes uh, towards something that you've prepared and the last 30 to 25 minutes on the thought leader. Um, so, and here's the funny thing is we've spent, I mean, just this year, we've spent $800,000 on thought leader fees on, on speaker fees for our yeah, and Emmett Smith's not going to turn up for your, for your thing for free, right? He's yeah. going to get something. Okay. If we had a PR team though, um, we would be able to get lucky every now and then, right? Like I got lucky with Jordan Belford. He agreed, right? Like we got, we got, we, you get lucky sometimes, but then once you get enough capital to reinvest, it's better, it's easier to just pay the money. Um, right. So um, that is a big insight I wanted to give was that the big flashy speakers don't sell as much tickets as the, the lawyer who's going to show you their exact intake system. Right. Right. So I'm just, we, we got, we got, I'm not going to name names cause I don't want them to see this, but we have gotten big people that if I said their name right now, everyone would know them and sold worse tickets than having just a lawyer who's going to open the hood on how they did X, Y, or Z. Um, yep. So, you know, don't, don't get, don't get high on your own supply. Um, if you're going to start using thought leaders and speakers, um, and make, make sure that the content ends with you being the expert rather than the person you interview. I love that. that that's a, that is a powerful mind, mind shift, right? You're not just trying to feature people for the sake of featuring, right? You want to yep. feature them and then bring back, you know, the, the next step in going deeper with you. I think you do that, which is a lot of people who do the interviews is you're, you're very good at active, active summarization, active listening. So you, you'll take what I said and you did it three, three or four or five times throughout this, where you're like, guys, notice what he said here, this, 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 and this. So you're not just letting me ramble on. You're going, listen, I've, I've been around the block. Here are three principles. You just heard him say, because I'm an expert and I noticed these three principles, right? So naturally good marketers like you, do this, but I see a lot of people um, not not do it well. And it kind of leads the audience off a, off a cliff to like, okay, either go check that person out more or thanks yep. for hanging out. We'll talk to you next time. Yeah. And, but with you, like, I, I, I keep using you as a great example because like you're, you, you, I would say are, are an exception because of how much value you're providing in so many different areas. I'm saying for most people, for most people, like you could get away with making your talk show around other people because you're providing value in so many areas that you can make this show all about me and people are still going to know, like, and trust you. So, but for most people getting started, I would say that you would want to avoid making it about the other person. Love that. So we've got the big summit. 
We've yep. got the the weekly talk show. It happens every single week. Yep. Sometimes you're paying for someone. Some sometimes it's someone that just wants to come on and share. Yep. Um, that fills the pipeline, keeps things cranking for the three sales guys. Plus, we've got like a Facebook ads funnel that people can opt in for and mm -hmm. kind of enter a webinar funnel. That keeps that keeps the the revenue growth happening. Um, we'd love to talk a little bit about delivery and retention at scale yeah. with the time that we have left. Yep. Um, Give me, give me a word in the comments if you're good with with like squeezing a little bit more out of Bill while we've got him with us. Um, so I, I still got, I still got know, like 20, 30, 50 people at once. Um, yep. Talk to us a little bit about how we how do we deliver this world class experience yep. right out of the gates. Yep. So and and I can go again until like 415 Eastern. So um, we can dive into this. So here's here's the interesting thing, Josh, is like I'm good at the event stuff and like I, I I'm passionate about it. Right. But. The thing I go to sleep at night worried about is precisely what you just asked about. The event stuff, like, that's cool. It's exciting. Everyone wants to know more about it. But I go to bed at night worried that we're going to lose all of our clients and go up in flames. I mean, that's that's my secret entrepreneurial fear in the back of my head is that everyone's going to leave. All of our renewal rates from last year were just a joke and luck. I could see you smiling because these are <laughs> these the fears, yeah. fears of an agency owner, right? Um so here's, this is the most important thing. Hands down. If you can retain clients, I don't care what your sales process is like. It, it trumps events 12 to 1. Why do I say 12 to 1? Because you're only getting someone for the first month or half month at an event. Like what happens the 11 and a half months after the 14 day window? Like and how, wh why would they enthusi this is the question I always ask myself, why would they enthusiastically renew with us for another 12 months without a sales pitch? Why would they go, you know, yeah, I'm going to renew with this company because they over deliver. Like, that's what I'm worried about. So here's, here's what I have for that. The first thing is net promoter score has to become like your your holy grail. I mean, surveying clients, it's going to suck in the beginning. You're going to get a low net promoter score. You're going to think, oh my God, why did I ask my clients for feedback? Um, you're going to regret doing it um, when you roll out net promoter score the first time, right? And then you're going to start reading. So I was just going to say net promoter score for those of you that don't know is basically you send a question on a scale from one to 10, how likely would you be to refer us? Yep. Um, you know, anything less than a nine or a 10 means you've got a problem with that client. Right. Um, and you need to work on it. So, sorry, I just wanted to interject for those that might not know. Yep. So net promoter score. Yes. Yeah, a survey you send randomized, not manual. Don't just send it to the happy clients. Randomized using a tool like ask nicely. That is that. randomized, not coercing people to respond with positive, you know, reviews that is a skewed net promoter score not you're not looking for positive stuff here you're looking for insights so someone will respond back one to ten and how likely they are to refer you right and a nine or a ten is a promoter a six a seven or an eight is a passive and a six below is a detractor the average agency net promoter score i read in an article once is zero meaning that the detractors net out from the promoters in most marketing agencies. There's been another study that was released that said it was 30, right? That is not good, okay? An excellent net promoter score is 60. A world-class net promoter score is 70 plus, okay? So our first net promoter score was trash. We, we heard all these complaints. It was probably around like the... I don't even know, 15 mark, right? Just because all the people who were angry just happened to respond to it the first time we rolled it out, right? So we, but we, in a humble frame of mind, we looked at their complaints and we said, you know what, they're right. And we took ownership for every single thing they complained about. If they were saying they weren't getting enough leads, we said, why does this precious person who's trusting us with their marketing think this? Uh, was it an expectations problem? 
Was it a true product problem, right? Or was it uh, some budget problem or something that they decided on that was not right for their strategy, right? She started reverse engineering, like, why is this client saying they're not getting results, right? So the first thing that that net promoter score caused us to change, I actually had two one-on-one -on -one calls with Joey Coleman, the author of Never Lose a Customer Again. And he told me all this stuff. He was like, okay, you gotta, it's all expectations, right? So we built this elaborate expectations agreement that we rolled out to all of our clients. And literally there are checklists. They have, in order to proceed to step two of our expectations agreement, they must check each box. I understand that in, at around month three, I'm going to complain about leads and here's going to be the contributing factors to that. Check. They have to check the box and then click a button that says, I have read and understand number one of the expectations agreement. Okay. Number two, um, uh, you will, uh, you, I am completely on board with following SMB team's proven process that is gotten da -da 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 results for this many law firm owners check i agree with number two of the expected so we have we have um we have general expectations as a company we have agency expectations and we have coaching expectations so it's a three section expectations agreement that they must check every single box i understand my website's going to take this long to launch and it's going to be really painful to build because there's going to be a lot of back and forth that's going to screw up all the timelines that we told you I understand. Check. Like, so Joey Coleman said, take everything your clients are going to complain about and push it forward to the beginning of your relationship and just tell them, here's what you're going to hate. Here's what you're going to hate. Here's what you're going to hate. And here's why. So that expectations agreement came from the pain of our net promoter score surveys, right? Um, Great insight, guys. And definitely check out Never Lose Another Customer. Great book. Yep. So... The, so that's really important because that gave us insights around why they weren't happy. And by the way, it's never, I didn't get enough leads or I'm not getting an ROI. It, that's crap. That, that is so surface level. Okay. I don't believe that my marketing doesn't work is a real complaint of an agency customer. I, I, don't, I just don't believe it. I believe my strategy doesn't work. I believe my budget doesn't work. I believe my expectations don't work. I don't believe my marketing doesn't work though. There's only like five websites that people can really market on right now. They work. They wouldn't be the largest market cap companies in the world if, if they didn't work. It's the strategy. So we're trying to proactively show them that there's more. And that's why our coaching program is so important is because it opens their mind to, ah, maybe it's the keyword research or keyword selection. Ah, maybe. So they stop criticizing the agency and they start going, hmm, maybe it's our keywords. Maybe it's our... Um, so that really changed the game for us. So then we took our NPS and we applied it to our actual team doing employee net promoter score, right? Making sure that our team was happy. And again, when we first rolled it out, it sucked. And we realized we had a culture problem, right? Cause when we, when we were going from a million to 4 million, almost every single person on our team had to be, had the part ways with almost every only one of my first 10 team members are still working with our company right now. So, so what, what got you to 4 million didn't get you to 15 million, right? And what got you to a million is not going to get you to the next level usually. Yep. Now from one, because you're going to attract the startup people, right? And those are spectacular people in the beginning phases of it. The people who would join a two employee agency, they love the lack of accountability and the, disorganization they thrive in it and then as soon as accountability has to get thrown in with deadlines deliverables responsibilities quarterly gold kpis right as soon it's just a different person and they have to be okay with that accountability shift um so we started rolling out employee net promoter score and we realized that there was almost nothing we could do to change the happiness of our team Hmm. Aside from all the typical culture stuff, which we do, like lunch and learns and, you know, get togethers, all that good stuff. We needed to hire happy people. Right. And this is the biggest insight was, OK, let's hire people who are happy in a high growth, high accountability environment. So 
we change our whole recruiting process around our vivid vision. So our vivid vision is our four page PDF document that shows where we will be three years from today. All of our core values are in it. Every growth rate, everything we want to reach as a company is already in that document. So when they read that document through our recruiting process after the second interview, they already know what they're getting into, right? And then we have core value vetting screening, and then we have technical screening. So by changing our recruiting process, our employee net promoter score is now in the 80 to 90 range for the last two years because we hired happy people who want to grow. And you're never going to take a bad attitude person and turn them around. It, you can take someone who is a core value fit and coach them to become that next level of leader. But this is where I spend 80% of my time thinking now is how am I going to coach our leadership team to coach their teams, to hold their teams accountable to the standards that we, that we are setting on our growth journey. And that stems from employee net promoter score um, as a self-awareness exercise. The only other thing I'll add in this is like, this is the hardest thing is whatever the agency owner is good at is going to end up becoming what they're weak at. Mm. As you know, Vern, Vern Harnish says in scaling up, the strength of the owner becomes the weakness of the business. So if you're strong at even my events are going to eventually become a liability because it's dependent on me selling from stage. Right. So if you're good at Facebook ads, it's hard to hire an expert for Facebook ads and yeah. to believe that they're smarter than you. So the biggest insight I had was that I'm the dumbest person in the room and I'm okay with that. And I'm just going to hire people who are smarter than me who already have experience in agencies. And the, the insight is I'm going to hire people who tell us what to do, not the other way around. And that has been, that has been the biggest shift aside from the events. Like, think about this, think about this. Like if I were to poach the person who pulls off all of Tony Robbins events, I wouldn't have to be good at events. Like they just figure it out. Like if I, if I poach the person who runs a 50 employee SEO company, I don't have to figure out the how to, I got to convince them on why to join our vision. Why should they leave where they're at right now? And that's where you start stepping into the, the level five leadership category. So that's what I'm focused on right now. So, so good, man. So, so pop. I love the idea of, like retaining at scale, it's not just about, you know, creating great experience. It's really crafting that experience and then being willing to look in the mirror, right? I think most agency owners just want to think it's not, you know, they, they were a crazy client or they were, they were nuts. But putting those NPS surveys out, getting the feedback, looking at it, not being defensive, being, okay, what do we change? How do we get better? can be a magic bullet in terms of how you improve. If you're willing to look in the mirror and make those adjustments. Um, and then the fact that you didn't just apply it to the client, but then you thought like my team, the people that do the work is really what's going to determine our, our long-term retention, right? If I've got a bad team that's not engaged, that's not willing to go above and beyond, I can change everything with my service offering, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't make it work. And so NPS to the, to the team and then realizing we need to up-level the team to get to the next level. Um, and then just thinking bigger around, the team that got us to four million is probably not the team that's going to get us to eight million. And rather than hiring startup people and kind of training them how to do this, find the person that's done it and pay the dollars to get them into your company. Huge man, powerful, powerful stuff. I know you've got a hard stop here, so I want to be respectful of your time. This has been amazing. I want to see amazing in comments if you feel the same, because I know you do. A lot of you guys sticking around through through this session. Um, if you had one last piece of wisdom, one last insight to share with that agency owner that's trying to get to the next level, what would that be? Yeah, I think, I think it's don't seek freedom um, prematurely. Um, mm. I think a lot of agency owners enter the agency world with selfish motives around how much money they want to make and how much freedom they want. And the market's going to pick up on that. The market's just going to pick up that you're in it for your own little selfish freedom or profit reasons. And I think as soon as the light switch goes off to where you start worrying about impact on your clients' lives, on your team's life, on, on, even on the whole industry that you serve's life, 
as soon as you have that light switch moment to impact rather than freedom, you'll get the freedom that you've been wanting. You'll get the profits that you've been wanting. And I know for me, I read the four hour work, work week years ago uh, from Tim Ferriss. And I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to autopilot all this stuff. And, you know, and, and I tried it and I wrote this ebook and tried to create this info product business. And it didn't work because it was all about me and my own little selfish needs to have profit and freedom. So I think, um, I think my, my parting piece of advice is, you know, really, really attached to what impact do I want to have on my industry? Like if I were to die this week, it, how, what, what would I want other people to say about me and my industry that I inspired them to do? Um, and then you'll be just mind boggled with how the freedom appears and, and the profits that you've been wanting and the growth you've been wanting gets reciprocated by the universe. That'd be my last, my last little tidbit there. So good. Focus on impact first and freedom will follow. Yes. Love that, man. So many great insights, so many nuggets, so many great resources. You mentioned some masterminds you're in. You mentioned some books that you've read that have influenced you. Amazing stuff. I'm so sure if, if the one. listeners want to, yeah. Traction, Traction, EOS. I like the fact that you said you coach the, the attorneys on how to implement EOS, which is we run that in our agency. We, we show the agencies how to implement that. It's, it's a game changer and leveling up and creating that freedom over time. Um, if, if the agents who want to like connect with you, learn more about you, what would be the best way to do that? Uh, just, you can follow me on Instagram, uh, Bill Hauser, biz, B I Z H A U S E R biz. Um, and I think another good resource for everyone, uh, is to go to tools.smbteam.com. I have all these, um, personal development tools that I put into this bundle, um, one day. Uh, so yeah, you can just get all my personal development growth tools for free at tools.smbteam.com. Amazing. Other than that, you can always email me at bill at smbteam.com. Bill, congratulations on building a $15 million business. I have no doubt it'll be 20 and, and, and north of that very, very soon. Thanks for your generosity and coming on and sharing this with the group. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure. I know I've got a ton of notes here that I'm going to take back. And uh, thanks so much for sharing. Keep crushing it. And uh, we'll take it from there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Josh, for everything that you do for the agency community. It's, uh, it's inspiring to see someone uh, with, with just pure motives and someone who really wants to help people. So I'm happy to help in any way I can. Excellent. Thanks again. And guys, if you want more ideas and insights on how to grow your digital marketing agency, go to sevenfigureagency.com. If you want to listen to more interviews like this, um, you've, you've got a whole inventory that you can go back and, and reference. Bill, this has been great. I know you got to hop. Thanks again for your time. Thanks, everybody, for, for checking in. In comments, what are your takeaways? What are your action items? And we'll, we'll leave it there. Thanks again, man. See you later.